Okay, so today we're going to talk about something we're going to call the control volume approach. So essentially, we're just going to rederive the finite difference equations, but uh, you know, previously what we did, we started with a PDE. Right? We started with the partial difference equation. We made the finite difference approximation substitutions into the PDE and derived the discrete equations. Right? This time we're going to basically derive the discrete equations without making specific reference to the PDE by just doing a balance of mass on the control block. And our control blocks are going to be the same sort of rectangular finite difference grids that we have. Okay? And the reason we do this is sort of twofold. One reason is because in the end we get the same equations. Right? So you say, well, why go through a whole derivation just to see the same result? Right? But there's two reasons. One, this is sort of a prelude to what, we're, what something's called finite volume approaches. Okay? So in a finite difference scheme like we're using in this class, if we have something interesting going on in the reservoir, the only tool we have is to do sort of uniform grid refinement. Right? So we can have, and we will learn really soon, how to do sort of graded meshes. So you may have a, a region in your reservoir that says a different permeability than the rest of it, and it, <laughs> and it transitions quickly. So in, a, in, in order, so in, in a, if you have a, a quick transition from one permeability to the next, you're going to have a steep gradient in the pressures. Right? I mean, the extreme example would be from, from to zero permeability. Right? You're going to have a steep gradient in the pressure in those regions. In order to capture those steep gradients, the only tool we have in finite differences would be to do some type of local refinement, right? But it has to be uniform, sort of as I've drawn it here, right? So say you had some something interesting going on in the reservoir, and you could locally refine like this, right? So we have that tool available, available to us in finite differences. Right? So we can do uniform refinement like this. But what if in our reservoir we had some feature like maybe a fracture? So we've got a fracture running through the reservoir like that. Well, it would take an extreme amount of refinement to capture that fracture to any degree of accuracy if all you're subject to is sort of uniform rectangle or rectangular refinement. Right? However, on the other hand, if I free myself from the restriction of using rectangles, draw my reservoir again, fracture. If I free myself from that restriction, then I could come up with some type of mesh that conforms to the fractures, or to the fracture in this case. So now I don't have rectangles anymore, but I can devise the sort of next most <laughs> complicated scheme I could devise would be something called a finite volume scheme. So each of those now um, polygons, not necessarily rectangles, each of those polygons we could write a mass balance on. And so the techniques that we'll use, we'll only demonstrate it for the square, you know, and this is what we're going to do today, what we call a control volume approach. We're only going to demonstrate it for the square or rectangular uh, grid above. Right? But just know that it's the same principles would apply to these polyhedra, where you're basically just going to balance the fluxes coming in from each side of the polyhedra. Okay? Now, it's a little more complicated in this case because those fluxes have derivatives in them. Right? Think about Darcy's law. Right? It's got a pressure gradient term in it. And so you have to approximate that derivative somehow. And the way we approximate it when they're rectangles is real simple. You just approximate it from a finite difference approach, right? Because you can do that. But when you have this more complex polyhedral, you have to do something else. Right? That something else we're not going to cover in this class. We're not going to cover a true finite volume method in this class. But just understand what we're going to do today is the, <coughs> the sort of intermediate extension from the finite difference approach to a more, more complex 
fun at volume control. So I don't know if I lived, said the second reason. So that's, this is one reason we're going to go over this today. The second reason is that this framework makes it a little bit easier to explain how we handle heterogeneities. So next week, we'll talk about heterogeneities. And this sort of control volume framework makes it a little bit easier to explain how we handle heterogeneities. And so in, in, the, in, the, in the most extreme example, you know, if, we, if this room was a grid block, and we're solving for the pressure in the center of this room, the next room over is a grid block. We solve for the pressure in the center of that room. In, in one extreme example of heterogeneity, this room could have permeability and that room could have none. Right? And so therefore, we want to compute or have a flux vector, basically, that goes from the center of that room to the center of that room. But we can't actually have fluid transport into that room because it has no permeability. Right? So we do a special type of averaging. And, and this, this idea of basically the flux vectors running from one room to the next or one grid block to the next, uh, this framework that we're going to show today is, is a little bit easier to explain how we do the averaging and we do the, we handle heterogeneities. So what we'll do is we'll start with our three grid, with three, a, a three grid block system. So we'll have grid block I, I minus one and I plus one. Right. And we're just going to pull out grid block I. And we're going to consider the different masses that might be flowing into it. Right? So we could have fluid flowing in. And we're just going to choose a convention that things are going to flow from right to left. Of course, when we solve the equations, the, the, any negative signs would, would mean the opposite of these sort of flux vectors. Right? So we're going to have fluid flowing in from I minus 1 and out from I into I plus 1. And so this flux, because it flows, the, this flux occurs at the boundary of the grid block. In this case, we call our grid block a control volume. So we draw a box. It would be the same idea if you just drew a polyhedron. You could do the same thing. We, we have a control volume, and there's some fluid flow fly, flowing into that side. Okay, but because of where it lands, right? It, it's it's we're going to use a special notation because of where it, you know we solve for the pressures at the center of the grid blocks, and the flux is coming from on the grid block is coming right at the edge, right? So we're going to call that we're going to call that flux Q. I minus a half. Right? So it's halfway in between I and I minus one. Right? Likewise, over here, we're going to call this Q I plus a half. We're going to consider the case where we might have an injector into I. Right? So the, in, the injector into I we'll call. QI. And then we're just going to write down conservation of mass. Right? So we have mass in, in words, we have mass in minus mass out plus injected produced has to be equal to the accumulation. So then just using our diagram here and our sentence or you know our verbal statement of conservation of mass, we're going to write down those terms. So the mass in is going to be the density under reservoir conditions, because we want to solve these equations in the in the reservoir. So the density in, under reservoir condition, conditions times Q I minus a half. Right? So that's the velocity of the fluid coming in. So this is a rate. Right? So we have the density times the velocity. The total mass, then you have to multiply by a time to understand it, the total mass that comes in. Right? So this is a rate. If we multiply by time, then we have mass. So we'll just multiply by delta T. 
some time in here. So that's the mass in. The mass out is the density, again, and the reservoir conditions. QI plus a half. Injected, the density and the reservoir conditions. QI, yep, times delta T, thank you. Equal to, and the accumulation is gonna be the mass at the beginning of delta T, I'm sorry, the mass at the end of delta T minus the mass at the beginning of delta T. And the notation we use for that is, is the superscript, n plus one n. So this is, this is the change in mass over a time step, delta T. Okay. So first thing is we're gonna make some substitutions. The mass at I, the mass in the grid block, is the density under reservoir conditions times the porosity times the volume of the grid block. So the volume of the grid block is, is a fixed quantity. Right? It's, it's what we drew. That was our control volume times, and then right now we're just talking one dimensional, so there's some cross-sectional area into the board. Right? So, it's, so that's the volume. Phi is the porosity, so the, the total volume of the grid block times the porosity is the volume of the fluid times the density and the reservoir conditions gives you the mass. We also have Darcy's law, so Q at I minus a half is gonna be equal to Ka over mu delta x. Let's do this. So Dorsey's law is this guy times pressure gradient. Right? This guy times the pressure gradient. And so this is what I was saying, there's derivatives in the flux, the pressure gradient term. Right? But here, since the flux is just going from right to left, we can find that difference. The, the, you know, we, the vector is just a straight arrow that way. Right? It would be different over here if I had to draw a flux into one of these to reiterate what, why this is different. To compute that flux is much harder than to just compute that one. Because I can, I can approximate the pressure gradient on a rectangular grid with finite differences. I can't, I can't necessarily do that approximation. So I'm gonna approximate the, this with a finite difference approximation. So PI minus PI minus one over delta X. And if you remember last time, if I wrote a BW there, we used a special symbol for this term. We, we used a special symbol for that last time. Huh? All the people that weren't here are the ones answering. It's T, right? It's the transmissibility. So if the BW is in the denominator, then we called that the transmissibility. Okay. So we're going to use, so we're going to say this is equal. This is equal to T. And again, because this is, this is a, a we're balancing, or this is a something coming in, and we want to, we want to use this. It's coming in from this side. And this will be helpful. This will actually what we'll see with heterogeneity is to use this in index here. So we're going to say this is Ti minus a half times Bw times Pi minus Pi minus 1. And again, the Bw is there because T has the Bw in the denominator. Right? So this T times Bw gives you back Darcy's law. And then just the last thing we're going to plug in is this QI here, right, remember this is the injected and produced term. This QI, we typically inject fluid in stock tank barrels, right, at the surface. 
So if it's an injector you, or a producer, right, you, you, you care about things in stock tank barrels at the surface. So we're going to say that QI, which is under reservoir conditions, maybe I just write that there, reservoir conditions, is equal to BW times QSC. So this is just a conversion. This is just a conversion because we want to we want to inject. This is going to be an injector at the surface. All right. So I'm on the next slide. I'm just going to I'm going to substitute these three things in. to that equation. Then we're going to divide by density under standard conditions times delta T. And that's going to give us this equation. Okay, so the left-hand side doesn't look exactly like what we had before, but it doesn't look that foreign either. The unknowns there are pressures, right? Because the T's are just the T's are just coefficients. Oh. So in that in the first QI was random from twice, right? The next the the other one should be dry at <coughs> some random QI, right? So for the row. Over there, it should be plus, yeah. You mean right here? Yeah. yeah. So. I fixed it in the second equation, I guess. All right, so yeah, so the, the unknowns are pressures. You know, before we had T, and, and you know, we also haven't made any decision about the time step we're going to evaluate those pressures at yet. But the main problem right now is on the right hand side, you know, we, we have these the very the unknowns of velocity and density still. We need to get that into pressures, right? So the only unknowns in the whole equation is the pressures. Yeah, if if the permeability in both grid blocks are the same, yeah. it'll 
you'll see at the end that it all just simplifies to T, right, like we had before. But next time when we talk about heterogeneities, when one grid block has a different permeability than the next, then that will have more significant meaning. So right now it doesn't really have a significant meaning, but it will in the next next week. Yeah, it, sh it should be negative, unless maybe maybe the negative sign has just been distributed. Um, yeah, the sign the sign's been inverted in the pi plus one minus pi thing. Distributed. Okay. So we're gonna work on specifically on this term for a minute. We're going to work on modifying that term. That's going to be equal to I love this trick. Actually, you, you, surprisingly, this works a lot in computation. I'm going to, to this term right here, I'm going to add zero. I love it when I get to add zero. And it, and it, and it helps you. So I'm going to add zero. Just my zero is going to have a special form. Everybody agree I just added zero? That and that are the same thing. So if I take that and I subtract itself, then that's zero. So I just, I just added zero in the middle of my equation. <coughs> that allows me to rearrange a little bit. This adding zero trick again is a, something that shows up a lot in sort of computational work where you're taking finite time steps and it works sometimes. <coughs> so now we're going to recall some linear approximations that you probably saw in petrophysics. One over BW in. I'm just going to do a Taylor series expansion about some reference time. And I'm going to call that reference time zero. Understand this doesn't necessarily mean zero time, which I'm just going to indicate the, the point which I'm doing the Taylor series expansion about zero. And so so I have that, and then I have this. For the formation volume factor, I have that. For the porosity, I have this. 
So these are sta these are just Taylor series expansions about this reference time zero. And so remember the remember the the formation of volume factor is like the density, right? Technically, it's a ratio of densities, but it's it's got density in it. And so if I Taylor expanded, you know, and I get a term that's sort of the second order term is like the the derivative of density with respect to time. Well, I can replace that with the change in pressure, the, the bulk modulus times the change in pressure. One of, the, the compressibility is one over the bulk modulus, right? And the, you know what the bulk modulus is? It's like the material's resistance to compression. It's a material property. So, uh, so I can change that to one over the bulk modulus with respect to the change in pressure. And then, so you get something that looks like this. So this is, remember, so this is, has to do with the change in density, right? And this is the change in porosity. So you see the fluid property there. And here you see the rock property, one over the bulk modulus of the rock. And even though this is termed in terms of porosity, it's also the same thing. It's like the change in density. And, and, and the reason is, right, if I have a fixed control volume, so my control volume size never changes by design, because I fixed it. And the control volume has some porosity. And then, say, due to increasing fluid pressure, the porosity increases. Right? So there's fluid in that pores. We increase the pressure due to injection or some other reason. The pores grow. Control volume's fixed. The pores grow. Therefore, the density of the rock had to increase, right? Because the pore size increased. Right? So even though these are they look different. They're, they're really saying the same thing. This has to do with the change in density of the fluid. This has to do with the change in density of the rock. It's just expressed in terms of porosity. All right, so in the next step, which will be on the next slide, I'm going to plug, you know, this is, a, this is an N. So I'll plug this equation exactly into there. But this equation also holds for if I just index this N plus 1 and N plus 1. So I'll plug that in there. And then this one, I plug this in there. And it also holds if I say n plus 1, n plus 1, then that goes there. No, this is the linearization, right? So it has to be about, uh, you know, this reference, this reference time has to be about something close to this. We'll see that in just a second. It's just the first term of the Taylor series. Because right? large time step is not really two terms, three terms. Okay, so plugging those guys in, I get, I'm trying to preserve the colors for some of the special. So if you look at this, the ones cancel and the P0s cancel. So that you end up with that guy. Likewise for the change in porosity. <coughs> 
ones cancel. But these zeros cancel. So then to your point, if we assume that that linearization is done about a small time step or about a time close to when the pressure is equal to, P, you know, when, when the P pressure P0 is equal to Pn, then these guys with the zero superscripts, they just revert back to B, W, and C. And so with that, then we get... So remember where we started here. We started manipulating this guy. Right? And so we manipulated to the point where now it's just the total compressibility CT times the porosity over BW. And that's for the ith grid block. So we're going to put that back into there. And our equation, at least on the right hand side, looks like it did before. Right? It's VI times C times CT over delta T times VW times the change in the pressure. So we have this guy. So the right hand side is identical to what we had before. Maybe we didn't have this source term there, but we could have always included it. <coughs> that, that has to do coming from Wells, right? <coughs> But this term is certainly identical. <coughs> On the left-hand side, we have to make that we're in the same position. 
We have to make a decision about where we want to evaluate those pressures. Do we want to evaluate them at time step n, in which case we'll get an explicit method, or we, do we want to do it at n plus 1, <coughs> in which we'll get an, an implicit method? And just real quickly, what you'll see, right, is let's just either, if you choose either one, right, if you choose n here, here, look at the pi term. The pi term will end up with ti minus a half plus ti plus a half times pi. Everybody see that? Let, let me just, maybe I'll just write it out. 